All right, welcome back. Treadle DPT, anatomy, muscle by muscle. Today, we're diving into a big one. Big back muscle, we're talking about the lats. Latissimus dorsi. Of course, you've seen it, you've trained it. Maybe you've even felt it get tight and you've seen it restrict overhead movements. Huge muscle, big role in strength, training, posture, function. So we'll do a, a deep dive for sure. We'll cover origin, insertion, innovation, function. And of course, I'll throw in a few clinical pearls along the way. So let's jump in. The lats are one of the wider, broader muscles in the body. It's a fan favorite in bodybuilding if you're trying to get that classic V tapered look. I mentioned in the trapezius video, work the traps for a wider back, work the lats for a deeper back. I actually think of the lats as more of a bodybuilder's muscle and a PT muscle. Very big, very superficial, crosses multiple joints, a lot of good exercises for it, a lot of bad exercises for it as well. But it's also a huge player in shoulder and trunk movement, so it does have some good clinical significance. I mentioned crossing multiple joints. We'll go through the attachments really quickly. The lats originate from a pretty wide span. We've got the spinous processes of T7 all the way down to L5, partially through that thoracolumbar fascia, but also into that thoracolumbar fascia, the iliac crest of the pelvis as well. And then we'll also have some fibers originating on the ribs nine through 12. So those bottom four ribs you'll see lat attachment as well with that attachment to the ribs the lats can act as an accessory muscle of respiration so that's both with deep inhalation and also forced exhalation a little bit of a sidebar though we've got a wide sweeping origin that's the main idea wide sweeping origin across the posterior trunk and pelvis and then when we come to insertion all of those fibers will converge and insert into the intertubercular or bicipital groove of the humerus. So they start low, travel up and out to attach to that front side of the upper arm. Three muscles actually insert into that bicipital groove or near that bicipital groove. Pec major being the most anterior, most superficial. Uh, the lats insert sort of in the middle area right in the floor of that bicipital groove and then teres major right beneath the lat insertion so we've got a little memorization technique we'll say lady between two majors again pec major is that top muscle if you're going anterior to posterior pec major is that very top very front muscle inserts on the lateral of the bicipital groove the lats are the next inserting on the floor of that bicipital groove. And then just beneath that attachment is the teres major, attaching on that medial lip of the bicipital groove. Just looking at the orientation, the attachments, considering the physics a little bit, we could see how the lats might play a big role in pulling that humerus back and down towards the body. Functionally, I think any pulling movements so pulling, climbing, rowing, walking with crutches if we think really functional movements to that point the lats are responsible for shoulder extension shoulder adduction and internal rotation of the shoulder so those are the major movements those three movements extension adduction internal rotation also plays a stabilizing role with heavy lifting and trunk control big widespread muscle a lot of attachments makes sense that it's a important stabilizer as well. When we're thinking exercises, really all of those pulling type movements, as I said, rows, pull-ups, lat pull-downs, all really good. We have EMG studies that indicate that the movements that get the most lat activation are chest supported shoulder extension and prone shoulder extension. So chest supported, having that trunk stabilized, you could really focus in on that engaging of the lats. And of course, similarly in the prone position where the chest is supported, your trunk stabilized, and you're fighting against gravity a little bit. Those are the 
maybe most beneficial movements for activating the lats. Innervation wise, we're looking at the thoracodorsal nerve, sometimes called the middle subscapular nerve. So if you're familiar with the brachial plexus, that would help a lot. The thoracodorsal nerve comes off of that posterior cord of the brachial plexus between the upper and lower subscapular nerve. So yeah, middle subscapular nerve is pretty cool name for just helping memorize placement. Primarily C6, C7, and C8 as far as root innervation. Read a study that pointed primarily to C7. Of course, there's a good amount of variance amongst the population. Like, we're all so different. I, I alluded to it maybe in the last two videos. But, I mean, the, the amount of fibers from the specific roots, it, it varies from person to person. C6 through C8 is pretty standard, though. This is one of the more straightforward muscle innervations, so just make sure we know the latissimus dorsi is innervated by the thoracodorsal nerve. From a clinical perspective, the lats could for sure be involved in a lot of shoulder mobility issues, range of motion deficits. Should be a big restrictor of overhead movements if it's tight. So you might see people lacking full shoulder flexion or struggling with some of their overhead lifts. Often lat tightness is part of that puzzle for sure. It definitely could be playing a big role in some of those restrictions. I don't often see too many lat specific pathologies or impairments. Strains or tears are pretty rare, but they do happen, especially in throwing athletes. Also, especially lately, I would say baseball pitchers specifically I've seen deal with a lot of lat tears. It's not one that's usually on top of my mind though, but because like I said, generally they're pretty rare, but maybe more common in baseball guys lately for sure. You put the lats under a lot of eccentric stress when you're doing that baseball pitch motion. And then we consider guys are playing a lot more these days, they're training harder, they're throwing much harder. Makes sense that that lat injury is more prevalent. Some signs of a lat tear are maybe a deduction or internal rotation weakness and then potentially maybe a change in some of the topographic anatomy. Maybe you'll see a little bit of a change in that axillary fold or that fold near your armpit. Maybe you'll see some bruising or swelling as well in that armpit area. But otherwise, I think it's relatively difficult to diagnose. And like I said, it's pretty rare. So not usually on the top of our minds when it comes to shoulder pathology. And with that, we are done. So yeah, another big player, big mover, big stabilizer. We talked about the latissimus dorsi, one of those muscles that spans a huge region, affects a ton of different movements. Next up, we're going to get a bit more precise. We're gonna talk about the rotator cuff muscles Specifically, supraspinatus. We're going to start with supraspinatus, so make sure to subscribe if you're into these breakdowns of clinical flavor. And it's been another great one, another speeder. Uh, Treadle DPT, I'll see you in the next one.